Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so John O'Sullivan is my name. I'm the current chair of the uh, Civil Division. And tonight's lecture is a co-hosted event between the Civil Division in Engineers Ireland and the Water and Environmental Engineering Society uh, in Engineers Ireland. So before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. We have two emergency exits. The first is the one that you came in this evening. And then in the event of anything being wrong there, we have the emergency exit uh, on the left. And can I also ask maybe that you just check that your phones and electronic devices are all off just to ensure that we don't have any interruptions. So the lecture this evening then is uh, we present an innovative approach uh, in the design and the rehabilitation of 5.2 kilometers of water main through Swords Village. Um, there are four speakers or five contributors to the event this evening, four of whom will be speaking. Our first speaker is going to be Peter Kyo. Peter is a chartered engineer with over 10 years experience in the utility industry and is currently a project manager with Irish Water. Regarding the projects that we're presenting this evening, uh, Peter was responsible for the project delivery, uh, including budget, program and technical output. Our second speaker then following Peter is going to be Owen Morton. Owen is a chartered communication professional with nine years experience and is a member of the Public Relations Institute of Ireland. Owen is currently a project communications lead with Irish Water and again with regards to this evening's lecture, Owen managed Irish Water's stakeholder engagement with elected representatives, businesses and the general public. Our third speaker this evening is going to be Patrick Cunningham. Patrick is a chartered engineer with over 20 years experience in the Irish Water services sector specializing in water conservation and asset management. Patrick is an associate director with Tobin Consulting Engineers and served as the employer's representative for the delivery of the project that will be presented this evening. And our final uh, speaker this evening will be Colm Connolly. Colm is a civil engineering graduate from NUI Galway and has 10 years experience in the utility industry. Column is a project manager with GMC Utilities and was responsible for the day-to-day -day site management of this evening's project. In addition then, and before I hand over to the speakers, I'd also like to welcome uh, those that are joining us uh, live on the webcast, um, and you're very, very welcome. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Peter to commence the presentation this evening. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, thanks, John. My name is Peter Kyo, and I was project manager uh, for the project. And uh, I just think today the aim of this presentation is just to give you a an overview of the project itself, um, the challenges that we faced, and how we overcame them. Um, I suppose the first thing I'd like to do is just kind of give you an overview of, of what uh, of, of the water main itself. Um, here is just a, an overview of the map. Um, it's a 30 inch water main. Um, it's it's 5.2 kilometers in length. Uh, it starts down in, in Cooks Road, that's just north of the airport and travels from <coughs> south to north and goes through the heart of Swords, uh, up Forest Road, Main Street, North Street, and up towards Lytton Hall, the M1. Um, so this water main is, is um, it's it's a 30 inch it's it, it it's a high pressure water main it's it's it works at eight bar uh it feeds swords and malahide port marnock areas so it's a strategic water main um uh, it has a, approximately 350 liters per second flowing through it um so i guess in recent in, in recent times it started to create uh, a couple of issues uh, predominantly being uh, burst, uh, bursts occurring on the main itself uh, which I suppose led to the project itself coming to a sustainable um, long-term solution to uh, an old main. It was built in 1970, 1975, so it was coming to the end of its life. Uh, I suppose just to give the project a bit of context, and one of the key aspects of it is is the location, and, and that is Swords itself. Uh, Swords is located in North County, Dublin. Uh, it's the largest town in Dublin. It's uh, the second fastest growing town in, in Dublin, in, in Ireland, should I say. It is a commuter, it's a commuter town, a big commuter town of Dublin itself, uh, with a population of 45,000. So to carry out any works in the area is obviously going to carry a lot of risk and a, a lot of obstacles. Um, 
Uh, obviously, there's going to be huge interaction with the uh, the 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 public, and obviously, you know, in itself, it's a micro economy. So there's going to be businesses that are heavily reliant in the area that to carry out any works will have a huge impact on. Um, so. Uh, just to give you some further detail on the project need, I suppose, why is the water main failing? Um, and one of them, the key aspects, is um, the rubber seal uh, at the joints of the water main itself. Uh, you can see here in the, um, in the top left-hand corner, we just have a graph here that shows, you know, after 30 years, the hardness of these rubber seals uh, begin to harden, uh, and it leads them um, to uh, deteriorate and eventually fail. And they can fail in quite dramatic um, situations. I, we have a couple of photos of them coming up later, but you can imagine with an eight-bar main, they can be quite significant. Um, and these bursts can have, um, you know, a big impact on swords itself. Um, here are just some photos that uh, indicate what we need to do when there is a burst. Um, there is huge disruption to the town itself. This photo here is of Main Street, so you can imagine there's significant traffic disruption. Um, you can see that it can take a considerable amount of time uh, with these photos here. Big concerns for health and safety for the public during a burst, also for the construction team carrying out the uh, repair works. Um, and there will also be issues with supply um, carrying out these works. There will be intermittent supply to the local areas, which is obviously uh, a key concern for Irish Water. Um, so I suppose the need for the project was to come up with a long-term solution so that these bursts wouldn't be continuing, you know, on a, a continuous basis, uh, and you know, ensuring a reliable supply of water to the communities. Um, like any construction work, um, we we're going to have a big impact on the local area. So a, a key to that would be uh, communications, and for a town like Swords, and the impact we we're going to have, it was a key aspect of this project. So I think I'd like to ask uh, Owen Martin to come here and just give you an outline of what that communication strategy plan was. Thanks very much, Peter. So the role of uh, the communications team on this project was basically to ensure that we solved the benefits of the overall project while mitigating against the challenges and the risk that the, the project itself kind of faced. I suppose we were trying to upgrade 5.2 um, kilometers of water main through the second largest town in the country. As you can imagine, that brings with it kind of significant challenges in terms of communicating the benefit of what that project is while we kind of have a short-term impact to people. So the challenge looking at, there was a significant amount of political interest in this project. Um, and also we had a huge amount of kind of potential impact to businesses, obviously being the second largest town in the country, it's a kind of sort of a commercial center for Fingal, but also for Dublin. So you've the second second largest uh, shopping centre in the town, which could be potentially impacted of the works. You have a huge number of um, retailers, retail parts. You also have um, commuters to the airport and kind of a significant number of stakeholders in that area. Then you're looking at kind of water supply issues throughout the, the delivery of the work, and uh, Pat and Colin will talk a little bit more about that. And then um, traffic management being the key. Swords is the largest commuter town supplying kind of the workforce towards Dublin, you're looking at how we kind of manage the traffic management and try and sell again the benefits while we have a short term impact. I suppose the benefit of communications is getting out and getting to kind of try and tell people why we need to do these works and what are the benefits. Um, as P Peter showed, people were aware in somewhat of the bursts that had happened previously on this water main and kind of had seen some of the benefit, but obviously as you try and turn up with a large TM plan, going through a town, people are always going to come up with fears. Um, so the risk here is linked both to the political interest and then also to the lo with the local authority trying to manage public perception. And the risk there is the granting of your road opening license, the granting of your road closures, and then obviously the risk of protests. All of those feed into budget and timelines. If we can't deliver that and we can't commun communicate that, that message, you're threatening your timelines and you're threatening your budget of your overall project. So that's there. Your, there, your risks. In order to mitigate that from the outset, um, all four of the speakers actually went to to meet Fingal County Council, the Roads Department, and the elected reps prior to this project kind of commi commencing on the road whatsoever. So we actually met with all of them in November um, prior to the work starting in January to make sure we had full on buy buy in from those key stakeholders to ensure that we could, they could give us the trust and confidence that we're able to deliver the communications on those. So throughout that, we kind of developed a solution as part of this project, which looked at kind of engaging with people, 
throughout a number of kind of a number of challenges or channels apologies for getting across those benefits to the public so in the first instance prior to works commenced and after we had met with Fingal County Council and the elected reps we held a two information evenings in swords and we brought along the uh, business and the chamber of commerce to that we had over 150 members of the public turn up which considering it's a town of 45,000 people it's not huge but in urban areas you tend not to get a huge turnout which are getting people who, who are going to be highly impacted as part of that and we we're able to sell the benefits of why why this project is needed in order to reduce leakage on the main but then all, and then also increase water supply to the area in order to hit a wider audience than that we needed to look at a number of other channels so we needed to replace two newspaper adverts as part of it in order to again get across more and more to as, as many people as possible um what what the works were entailed and what the benefits of that were um we did 52 weekly updates so as colin will get into in his part of the presentation and pat this project was delivered in a number of phases going from one end of the town to the other end of the town going from kind of working from south to north there's a huge variation in the areas that were impacted so keeping stakeholders elected reps um Fingal County Council, our website, everybody up to date with the same level of information was key on this project to ensure that we were able to tell them where we were going to be, when we were going to be there, what traffic management um, was in place, whether it be a, a single lane closure or a road closure, and then also when we were going to be, and the key, when we were going to be finished. Um, so we those updates proved very, very successfully. We had seven press releases on the project. Another really successful part of it um, of the communication strategy that was delivered as part of this project was two targeted Facebook posts. So for a minimal investment, it was a 600 euro per post. We ended up with 350,000 views for each one, each post. So if you think SOARS is 45,000 people, that's every, you're looking at nearly every person in the town has seen the benefit of the project and then also looking at why we, the benefit and the need for that project. So again, we're getting across the, the key needs there. As I said, we had our information evenings and then we, we also had a significant amount of engagement with the Fingal Chamber. Obviously, they hold quite a lot of power and sway in terms of <laughs> directing elected reps and what the issues are for the um, for commercial entities in the area. Throughout those um, briefings that we gave, we, we presented to Ryanair, Aer Lingus, and we had the DAA attend. We also had major pharmaceutical companies turn up who were looking at kind of to be informed that tr during the actual delivery of the project that the um, water supply wouldn't be affected, and that was the key. Um, and I might just th bring, take this moment then to pass over to Pat, who can bring you through the role of the employer's rep on this. Uh, thank you, Ron. <clears throat> uh, Tobins were appointed as employer's rep um, to look after and manage this project. Um, initially, our appointment started out with Fingal County Council. Um, However, uh, with the establishment of Irish Water, the project was then novated to Irish Water. Um, and just to acknowledge um, the fact, in terms of operational experience, uh, Fingal County Council themselves and Water Services had a lot of operational experience on this water main, the problems, the hazards, the risks, um, and had done some background uh, work on this and had quite a bit of work in terms of maintaining this failing asset, 40 years in the ground, deteriorating asset. Uh, investment was key in this, getting the investment to deliver the project. Part of the objectives of Irish Water and the establishment of, of Irish Water was to look at strategically important projects, um, look nationally at water conservation, water main rehabilitation, draw up a priority list of what are top of the list in terms of priority and the best place to put investment. So feeding into that, there was an analysis done on the operational uh, experience, the hazards, the risks, the repair information in terms of the cost of repairing, um, how frequently it burst, payback period in terms of how quickly this asset would pay back if the rehabilitation works were carried out. Um, part of our remit, we undertook a technical review report analysing all this information and putting forward a business case um, with Irish Water's um, water conservation team and quite quickly came to the fore that this was one of the key pieces of infrastructure that had to be rehabilitated. There was some field testing as well undertaken to, to prove the information that's been there. In terms of uh, the project need, the burst and repair history, the leakage, the figures there are highlighted, um, 1.4 megalitres a day when it 
it would affect 300 pro properties estimated, 10,000 customers, large industrial uh, businesses impacted by this, um, 2.5 births per annum on average, and that figure was escalating year on year. The aim or the objective and the delivery of the solution, Owen alluded to it already, minimize the impacts on local businesses, feeding into the communication strategy, minimize the impacts on traffic flow, one of the critical requirements, impact on the traffic, your first port to call when you arrive from the airport, you go towards swords, it's a reflection in the whole area, if there's an impact on traffic flows going through that area. Minimize the impacts on water supply. We saw photographs earlier about the impacts that a particular bus had in, in Main Street and Swords, and the interruptions in supply, 24 hour periods of shutdowns, minimize the impacts on transportation and emergency services. Um, keeping traffic flowing freely through for emergency services is a critical objective, and also to minimize the duration of the works program. What were the options? I suppose the options considered do nothing, first option. People would say that's not an option, but when the budget wasn't there, that's effectively, it was more reactive, the approach to it, repair the leaks as they arose. Until the funding was made available, we went through a recession, funding was tight. Um, Irish Water business case, they brought this to the fore and it put the investment into it. The second was to look at a new route, either through an open cut approach or a trench this uh, approach to this, or the third to look at the same route using either open cut <coughs> trenches technology or a combination of both. I've highlighted in red the third point there because that's the approach that was taken on this project. Specific challenges on this project. A significant risk was working adjacent to a high pressure mains, eight bar pressure, uh, operating pressure on a 750 mil diameter water main. Quite complex to work adjacent to a high pressure main like that. Uh, safety, first priority. We as PSDP carried out uh, risk assessments on that. Technical challenge, significant challenge to replace a large diameter uh, water main in an urban area using traditional methods, quite complex. Um, again, particularly the health and safety issue working adjacent to, to a water main of this size. Confinement, loss of development land in a time of a housing shortage. What I mean by that is you've got competing factions. If you're looking at an alternative route, you're looking at using more land in a built up urban area. And you've got competing factions for land availability where you're looking for land to develop housing and infrastructure to, to accommodate that. So that's a confinement. I've, I've classed that as a confinement issue. The options available, we're considering a new routing plan leading to protracted way leave negotiations. Again, that's tied to the first one. A new route, you're dealing with new landowners, and you have to make a strong case if you're going down the CPO to look at an alternative routing of pipelines. The guiding principles and the approach to looking at the options here. There's an ethos in Irish, Irish water, not only from the technical, but HSQE, health, safety, environmental, and quality. Taking the environmental in no particular order, what, what's envisaged in that is the ecological and archaeological constraints. And the studies carried out, looking at alternative routes, you're going through different lands, what are the ecological impacts, archaeological constraints, Swords, it's an old town, there's a castle in the middle of the town itself, archaeological issues, working and looking at excavating that new ground, or oh, some of it already excavated, but you have to take all these considerations on board. That's in terms of constraints from an environmental point of view. Health and safety, as PSDP, we carried out design risk assessments to highlight the principal risks associated with working with a water main in, uh, with the prevailing conditions, high pressure mains, and health and safety risks associated with that. That's just one particular item running through the, the, all the principal risks, uh, a separate exercise. Uh, quality, one critical thing on this was there's tried and tested methods in terms of using uh, traditional open cut for larger diameter mains. You're balancing that against a relatively uh, new, well, a trenchless technology itself is not new, but for large diameter mains, uh, you're looking at contractors in Ireland with experience of working with large diameter water mains 
And this was probably one of the largest water main diameters from a trenchless perspective uh, that was looked at in Ireland to date. So tying in with the ethos of uh, Engineers Ireland, I suppose, is, is one aspect of the CPT. CPD is a huge thing in, with Engineers Ireland. So in terms of attacking the project, the structure research and collaboration was one view that was taken on uh, studying and analysing the best way to, to, to approach this problem. So in terms of CPD, from our perspective, there's talks with industry experts on large diameter trenchless options. Uh, we reviewed international best practice, uh, going to the US, Canada has quite a, uh, a lot of research in terms of uh, using trenchless technology, IWA published papers, and also separately Irish Water, looking at the market capability in Ireland to deliver a project of this nature, doing the background research to say, is there the capacity in the market? Are there people out there that can do this? Um, moving on from that, that was, that was the, I suppose, the early, early on questions that had to be answered. Um, the other thing was to maximize the potential of the existing infrastructure to the use of existing techniques, techniques and emerging technology. I suppose one view on this was to look at the benefit or any benefit from the existing asset that was there that could be utilized in providing the solution. Um, also, trenches technology has a benefit in terms of reduction or potential reduction in carbon footprint. An open cut method requires excavating all the material that's there, reinstatement of a new pipe material, but all the backfill material that goes in there has to be quarried and brought from other locations. So there's a footprint associated, a carbon footprint. Trenches technology can help to reduce the carbon footprint. That's only one, one particular aspect of, uh, in terms of carbon reduction. Irish Water wanted to use this as a test case also on an approach um, to carrying out rehabilitation of water mains within an urban environment. Test case in terms of doing the technical as aspect of it, but also in terms of how it would be procured and managed. And that feeds in, it's a national importance in terms of active leakage control. Rehabilitation is one of the key principles of managing leakage within an urban environment, or nationally, sorry. The preferred option, gone through all the constraints, just flicked over them there quickly, didn't get, get into the meat of every particular part of that detail. But ultimately, the preferred option, taking on board some of those constra const uh, constraints, was to use the same route for the most part and using a combination of open cut and trenchless technology. However, before we did that, we had to test the preferred option that we were looking at and the best way of potentially tackling this problem. The first port to call on to help us with that was to, to, to undertake hydraulic modeling. Irish Water's hydraulic modeling team uh, did, did a bit or uh, did some work on the hydraulic modeling aspects of the project um, based on some field testing that was carried out on the ground. So on paper, we'd ascertained that the, this option would work and that the water supply could be maintained while using this trenchless technology uh, method based on looking at discrete sections of the trunk main that you could isolate segment by segment and keeping the supply coming in from two separate directions. So you're isolating discrete sections within the pipeline. With that plan, there was no planned long-term interruptions. However, it did require advance works to facilitate a limited and temporary backup or backfeed supply. I would stress that this was a temporary backup supply, not a long-term feasible um, option. Um, and trial, read, trial runs um, on the backfeed supply were undertaken by um, Irish Water and Fingal County Council operation personnel to ensure a temporary reliable supply could be maintained during the works. In terms of procurement, lead, leading on from the earlier point that I made about the background research on the market, there was a suitability assessment or pre-qualification process carried out advertising OJEC. As part of that, it was to attract an international market, not only nationally, but, and from that, we got contract, contractor, we assessed contractor suitability and, and their suitability to act as project supervisor for a construction stage in terms of managing the health and safety risks that are there. Following on, or in tandem with that, 
contract drafts were being prepared for the project, taking on board Irish Water's own standards, employer standards, protocols in terms of communication. Owen spoke about those earlier, about protocols and the work that had been done to date, and Irish Water's in-house protocols and procedures for dealing with communications and a whole communication team within Irish Water that deals with this and management of the project. Also, the HSQE requirements. I mentioned that earlier about the HSQE, health, safety, quality, and environmental. There was an emphasis on those, uh, those points with, within the contract docs. This contract was not awarded on price only. HSQE requirements and communication requirements were brought in to assess the suitability of contra contractors and managing the inherent risks that would be in the project and in having experience at dealing with communications within an urban environment. Following the suitability assessment, the docs that we had developed were issued to tender, uh, tenders and a design-build approach was adopted for this project with the objective of prom promoting innovation or the best model, it was felt the best model for delivery of the project because of the approach that was taken to delivery of the project. I mentioned earlier about the test case and this is part of the test case, promotion of innovation with, under a DB approach and I mentioned about a meet assessment. Following on from that, the contract was awarded in late October 2017. The contract works themselves. The concept, there was a concept design or specimen design based on the modeling, the testing that was done, and a precursor to the works being carried out themselves. We had information on paper that this was the pipeline that was constructed and the diameter of the pipeline. However, there was a requirement made for the contractor to carry out a CCTV investigative survey prior to doing construction on the project itself. That was to prove the records, I suppose, that were there. Based on paper, the paper exercise, it was estimated 3.8 kilometers of that 30 inch diameter priest priestess concrete pipe could be undertaken by a trenchless installation methodology using an independent structural pipe. And the, re the remainder of that pipeline was to be replaced using an open cut method, 1.4, which adds up to your 5.2 kilometers. I won't get into the detail of this. Suffice to say that these are the independent sections that were set up for the water main rehabilitation. So section 1A was isolated at the lower end and at the top end and everything else was kept operational. And that approach was carried out through section by section of the pipeline. Again, founded on the modeling, founded on field testing, founded on back feeds, trial tests that were carried out by Fingal and Irish Water. General requirements in terms of contract documents. I suppose these are reiterating some of the points that Owen made earlier. The general requirements, the contractor is required to facilitate the business of the general public, traffic, landowners and occupiers, minimize the impact on water supply, planned outages to be notified in advance in a protocol in terms of communications for dealing with that, and to minimize the duration of works. There was a program of 24 months given for this delivery of this project. Again, feeding on from all the risks that were associated with the project. Um, site restrictions, program constraints, early engagement with the stakeholders, the preferred hours for the works to be carried out, no night works because of residential properties, so, so on and so forth. So those restrictions were incorporated into the contract documents. The project impact Mitigating measures to reduce, reduce the potential impact on the public. I suppose the background, I talked about a specimen design, the background information that was provided, there was an outline traffic management plan done on how we thought this could be delivered. The road closures in consultation with the roads authority that might be required to do a project of this nature um, and diversions and access issues for properties and traders. Also water disruptions plans for how this could be done based on the modeling, temporary plan shutoffs, and also access to private lands. There was some limited circumstances that we need, needed to access to private lands, so they were covered under a CPO or compulsory purchase order. This all fed into contract requirements. This is what put on paper and the contractor had to, to, to abide by these contract requirements. 
contractor requirements, water supply, re re reiterating it should be maintained, only one section to be taken out of service at any one time, discrete five sections. Contractor to attend to any secondary reports as a priority, have a stock of repair material for this nature of this pipe to get in and do a repair on this as a priority. So stock supplies. And also, um, Colin will probably talk about this later, some of the health and safety measures that took themselves to ensure that these sections of pipeline were, were actually isolated, because we're talking about old valves and some of these and, and, and closures. But uh, Colin will bring you through that. Contingency, contingency measures. There was to be no long planned long-term inter interruptions. The contingency for, the, for that was to put some interconnections and overlander pipes and sections that would provide backup in the event of an unforeseen uh, arising. Advanced works I mentioned already, they were undertaken to facilitate a back, backup supply and trial runs were carried out. Pre-commencement or pre-construction. The contractor had submitted their designs as part of the DB design process, but pre-construction, construction stage submissions, after their, directly after their appointment, construction stage submissions were put forward. That entailed licensing and dealt with licensing and notifications, licenses from the roads authority uh, for the contractor's preferred way of undertaking these works. We were non-specific as to the type. We mentioned trenches, but we're non-specific about that particular type of trenches method that would be undertaken. Um, notifications, your standard notifications, HSA notifications, AF1 and AF2. A, sorry, AF1 was already in, so it's a HF, AF2. Uh, statutory notification to the Health and Safety Authority. Some early stage site investigation to support the contractor's own design and valve testing, as I mentioned, and I think Colin will elaborate on that. Stakeholder engagement, a huge emphasis on this project. Stakeholder engagement, critical to the delivery of the project. We talked earlier on about the stakeholders outside the contractor, but that was carried through from early on in the contractor non-confrontational approach to a contract, early collaboration. Just reiterate it there again. Collaborative approach between GMC as the appointed contractor, Tobin, Irish Water and Fingal County Council, with the view of providing the best innovative solution for the project. And with that, I'll hand over to Colm at the construction stage. Uh, thank you, Pat. Um, so my name is Colm Canali. Um, I was the project manager for GMC for this uh, project. Um, I suppose I'll take you through the main construction elements um, of the job and I suppose um, some of the, the issues and challenges which we would have faced. Um, so I suppose f from an initial planning stage, it was clear that we'd face a number of challenges uh, on this project. Um, <coughs> As was mentioned previously, Swords is one of the busiest towns in Ireland, and many of the roads are already over capacity. Um, I suppose from a traffic management point of view, it was clear that we'd need to come up with some innovative solutions to many of these problems. Uh, the sequences of works was very important, uh, factors such as uh, backfeeding the water main, um, burst history, school holidays, public events, uh, all this was factored in to, to the construction programme, which we, we, we finally agreed on. Uh, there was also a number of technical challenges um, associated with working with a water main of this size um, in terms of working with the main, welding the main and uh, ultimately commissioning the main. Um, I suppose over the next uh, 10 or so slides I'll detail these issues um, and kind of I suppose, how we overcame them. Uh, the first issue I suppose was traffic management. Um, this really before we could do anything we, we had to we had to get some agreement on the traffic management, the systems we'd use, and working times. Um, this started at a very early stage in the project. Um, we had early design concept meetings with Fingal County Council, uh, bus service providers, and Garda Síochána, and as well as the other main stakeholders uh, in Swords. Uh, once we'd received, I suppose, uh, a buy-in from, from these stakeholders, we began to apply for uh, road closures. Um, there was quite a long lead time involved in uh, preparing advertisements and advance notice to the residents, and also uh, there was some work to be done on the existing traffic infrastructure. Um, 
again, all this was done to, to minimize disruption to the public, as Pat mentioned, uh, so, swords, you're so close to the airport, um, there's high visibility there, so really we keep traffic moving while, while uh, providing a safe and adequate working area uh, for, for the guys. So I suppose in terms of traffic management, um, one of the main uh, challenges straight away would, was Main Street. Um, so I suppose Main Street and Swords is 500 meters long, um, and there's three busy junctions along those 500 meters. Um, initial and initially, it looked like a road closure was probably the only um, safe and effective way of carrying the work out um, on that section of the job. But I suppose it became clear very quickly that, that really wouldn't have been an option. Um, so we proposed to to basically make uh, the main street and swords a one-way system over the summer months. Uh, so again, this is obviously a, a pretty drastic uh, change to the existing traffic management. So it, again, a lot of upfront liaison and consultation with stakeholders. Um, there would have been a number of open evenings held, uh, advanced VMS signs, newspaper adverts, um, really everything we could do to, to notify the public in advance of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I suppose to make this work, to make it a one-way system, it's obviously closed. If, if you're heading north to south, it's effectively closed. So uh, what, what we did was basically divert people traveling north to south onto the Swords Bypass, and basically they'll come up from the top and travel south. Uh, to do this, there was quite a lot of um, reprogramming of the existing traffic lights, and there's also some temporary traffic light heads put in, uh, just basically to make it work uh, as effectively and uh, smoothly as possible. Um, I suppose the system was, was a success. Um, there was very minimal amounts of complaints and we, we got through that section of the job uh, pretty quickly. I suppose a little bit on the actual handling and welding of the pipe. Um, so again, this was something that we kind of, um, we knew from an early stage that this would be an issue. Uh, generally, these sized pipes are laid through fields, uh, not through busy uh, town centres. Um, so I suppose once we had agreed the team, we knew the size of sites that we would have to work with, and that in turn decided the, the length of pipe we could weld, how much we could slip line in one go, and, and, and those other um, factors. Um, I suppose the moving and handling of the pipes, each one of those pipes are 13 and a half metres long, and they weigh over a ton each. Um, so you can see in that picture, we actually had a, a special pipe handler uh, fabricated, which is mounted on an 18 ton rubber duck. And that, that I suppose that meant the process of uh, loading and un unloading pipes uh, quick and safe. Um, we also had a number of uh, specialist uh, pipe dollies, we call them, uh, fabricated. And these allowed us to move uh, long strings of pipe along the road safely and, uh, and quickly. And again, I suppose all these little things just made the project run uh, smoother and I suppose safer ultimately. Again, a um, bit more on the welding. Um, the pipe was butt fused using a Traxster 900. Um, There's only a couple of those in, in the UK at the time we were, we were doing this job. Um, so they're, they're, fair, they're, fairly, they're fairly rare machines. Um, I suppose. We, we try to do as much butt fusion welding as, as possible, but th there's all those places where, uh, due to location or, or just the type of work that electric fusion couplers had to be used. Um, generally, one butt weld took about an hour from, from prep time to, to welding and cooling. Um, and yeah, I suppose I suppose the for a job this size, the the testing, the testing and auditing of the welding was, was very important, um, just to ensure a high standard of, of a high standard of quality throughout. So so there was there was regular auditing carried out on the welding crew, and uh, there was a lot of well sampling uh, samples taken uh, to ensure the wells were up to scratch. So the actual slip lining process. Um, I suppose, as Pat mentioned, it was decided at an early stage that open cutting wouldn't be feasible through swords. It would probably have taken approximately two years to do it through open cut, and it would have been extremely disruptive to the locals. Um, so I suppose when we came on the project, uh, slip lining was kind of the agreed method uh, that we would use going forward. I suppose the process of slip lining itself, um, it's basically inserting a new uh, pipe, in this case, 710 HDP SDR 17P uh, water main, into the existing hose pipe. Um, 
So the host type in this case was a 30 inch uh, pre stressed concrete water main. Um, I suppose the benefit of it being pre stressed concrete, it was a relatively clean pipe. Um, sometimes, if you're slip lining cast iron water mains, there's a large amount of uh, scraping and cleaning that has to be done. So I suppose we're looking the sense that the water main was, was pretty clean and really once once the main had been drained down and the section of pipe taken out all we had to do was cctv the the, the hose pipe and i suppose the the cctv uh identified any obstructions in the pipe um any bins any reductions in, in internal diameter um so i suppose once the cctv camera went down we would mark out the location of these obstructions with a, with a, a gps and then we could we could dig in advance of the slip lining um the, did this this made the job run pretty smoothly uh, as we knew where all the obstructions were ahead of time uh, so again a bit more on the slip lining um i suppose generally the the excavation size that we required for this project was anywhere between 10 to 15 meters long um again this depends on the depth of the water main the water main was anywhere from from a meter and a half to, to two meters deep on this job um so once the, the excavation um, work is carried out, uh, some of the existing pipes are removed and uh, you start welding your pipe for slip lining. You can see in the picture on the right, um, there's a that's called a towing head. So that's basically a tapered uh, towing head, which is welded on the, the start of the string. And what that allows is the, the pipe can, uh, if there's any you know dislodged joint or any slight bends, it'll allow the pipe to just move a bit more uh, smoothly through the hose pipe uh, as it's been inserted. Um, I suppose the main the main technique we used to actually insert the pipe was simply using large straps um, and pulling the pipe in using a large excavator between an 18 and 20 ton excavator. Um, so again, this this is a simple process, but it worked very well and it was very quick. Uh, I suppose the advantage of that, that method over a winch, which is sometimes used a winch requires uh, two pits to be open at once, so you need to have your launch pit and you need to have a, a winching pit. Um, using this technique, we could just open one excavation and basically push uh, the, the, the pipe um, basically until it stopped, and then we, we would find the end of it and, and dig and start again. So I suppose in an urban area, that was a big advantage just to be able to work from, from one uh, single launch pit. Um, again, there was minimum clearance. The pipe we inserted was 710 OD, and the ID of the existing pipe was 750. So there was only there's only 40 mil uh, there's only a 40 mil gap there. So again, that that's where the benefit of the pipe being quite clean and uniform uh, was. Uh, as you can see there, the, the project was shortlisted uh, for the Irish Construction Excellence Awards under innovation uh, because of the, the slip lining technique used. Um, so I suppose once the pipe was installed. Um, the testing and commissioning had to be undertaken. Um, again, testing, chlorination, and pressure testing is something that, that I suppose Irish Water and GMC would be quite familiar with. But I suppose on this side of the water main, it's just everything's a little bit more difficult, I suppose. Uh, I suppose the first issue was the volumes of water that we required for testing. Um, there was a lot of close liaison with Fingal County Council, um, really just on where we could get the water from, how much water we could take, when we could take it. Uh, because it, it would actually affect our network, the amount of water we had to draw down to test the water in. Um, I suppose in terms of pressure testing, um, we, we, we use Antire UK, um, so they're an independent uh, company uh, that remotely logs um, the pressure test itself. So, so before, before Antire um, logged the test, we, I suppose the main thing on a main disk size is to remove the air. Um, so really, unless you're getting down to 2% air content on a main this size, you'll struggle to pass a pressure test. Um, so really, the, the way we achieved this was to to pass a swab through the main. Um, so effectively, what the swab does is it will it'll you fill the water behind the swab and it'll it'll push all the air out ahead of it. Um, and you, you you open your air valves and your hydrants. Um, and and this this will aid in getting the air content down to around 2%. Um, in general, if we got to 2%, the test would have to be on for about three to four hours, um, which isn't bad. I suppose uh, if, if the air content was higher to 8%, you could be looking at a test time of over 36 hours, um, which is that's obviously going to have a, a disastrous effect on your program if you're 
waiting for for a day and a half to to pass the test because you can't you can't touch the water in that case. So r really, uh, air content and removing the air w was crucial to uh, the testing and commissioning of this. I suppose f following the pressure test, um, really it was down to the the chlorination and the disinfection. Um, this was obviously very important. On a, on a main this size, serving a lot of people, uh, it, was, it was massively important that, that the main was correctly disinfected um, and, and, and chlorinated before it was brought into service. Um, so I suppose one issue with chlorinating the main this size is after, after you've done the chlorination pro uh, process, you have a large amount of chlorinated water and uh, in some cases it can be quite hard to dispose of that water. So you can see in the picture on the, on the right here, this is actually settlement tanks which we would pass the chlorinated water through. Um, this is then treated with sodium sulfate uh, to reduce the levels of chlorine to make it safe to uh, discharge back into the, 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 the foul water network. Um, following the, the disinfection process, um, both ourselves, GMC and Fingal County Council took independent water samples. Um, these were then sent to labs um, to test for the presence of uh, coleoforms and other bacteria. Um, once we received uh, uh, positive results, or uh, once once we confirmed there was no bacteria present, then the mains could be brought into service um, and uh, suitable for drinking uh, by the public. Um, I suppose finally, um, just on this project, the most important aspect of it uh, for ourselves, GMC and Irish Water, was was the health and safety. Um, that was clear from a very early stage. Um, so I suppose as a side team, we're very proud. Uh, we had an average HSQ audit score of just over 91% from Irish Water. And also there was uh, zero service strikes over the entire length of the project, um, which is, is fairly unheard of for a job this size. Um, you, you know, through through an urban area, so that was something that the crew and everyone involved was was quite proud of. Um, that's that's it for me, really, from a construction point of view. Um, I'll just hand you back to Peter now, and he's just going to conclude with a review of the project. Thanks, Colin. <clears throat> so I'm just going to bring you through like the the closure of the project, and one of the key aspects of that is the outcome of the physical works. Like obviously, as the guys said, uh, we now have a reliable supply to households, householders and businesses within Swords uh, and to the Malahide Reservoir. Uh, we also have experienced a reduction in leakage uh, by 1.34 million litres per day, and that's real results. Uh, as the guys were saying, the works were completed ahead of programs, uh, a program. Uh, we had anticipated a 24-month program. It, it, it resulted in 12 months using the slip lining. Um, the works also resulted in a nine million investment in the swords area, which is you know a, a great thing to be able to achieve. Uh, and also there was a, a forty five percent reduction in uh, carbon footprint of the construction methodology, which is like uh, key in the current environment we live in. Um, I suppose just on the project performance itself, um, you know I have the five Rs. Um, uh, I suppose using the slip lining was it was a key to to a lot of these. Like you know, obviously as I said, there was a reduced program. Using the slip lining was cheaper than using uh, open cut works uh, or you know um, yeah, old older uh, technologies. Um, there was reduced risk, as Colin touched upon. You know, we we didn't hit any um, utilities. Uh, we didn't have uh, deep digs through a, a high level urban area, which is key. Uh, again, reduced carbon. And we also have reduced disruption. Um, we've had the main live now for about 12 months and uh, no bursts recorded. So, you know, that's a reduction from an average of three, which is, is great to see. Uh, and then I just finalized just on lessons learned. Um, obviously, now we've we've proven, a, 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 you know, a slip lining at this scale, which is, you know, a new approach that we can now consider for projects going forward. I know there's a couple of jobs in Irish Water that are considering this approach. Um, you know, and just based on the on the lessons we've we've learned, obviously the communication strategy was key to this project, and it's something that we've now rolled out to a number of other jobs uh, in Ireland uh, across Irish Water, just where we're having a high impact on the locals, um, and just something to just a key um, you know benefit of this project was the collaborative approach. Uh, you can see that the guys they, they all work extremely well throughout the job, but. 
there's a wider team outside uh, of us as well that were critical to it. We had a great RE side team. Uh, we had ops who were critical to anything we did on, on the job with Fingal County Council. Uh, there's a wide range of people there that w- were involved in the job and just working together, like, you know, resulted in a successful project. And it's just worth uh, acknowledging that. And um, look, that, that's, that's, that's ultimately it. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, um, yeah, thanks. So thank you to uh, all the speakers, the four speakers, for what was a very, very uh, interesting presentation, I think. Um, And what we'll do now is we'll open it up to the floor for questions. And myself and Donald will circulate with microphones. And what I ask people asking questions to do is just perhaps give their name and the organization that they're coming from. And can I ask the four speakers then to maybe just join me up on the podium for this Q&A session? Thank you. So, yeah, if anybody just raises their hand and... Um, hi, my name is Rory McCarn I'm with RPS. I suppose it's a two-part question. The first one is, were the five uh, sections um, determined by existing line valves and how were the actual isolations achieved when you're working alongside the live main? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, the five sections were divided due to the, the existing valves. Um, so I suppose really it was a case of isolating the valves, and you know I suppose we had to be sure that the valves had worked and had isolated the sections. So in, if there was no hydrants or anything else present on the line to prove they were shut, we'd have to do a tapping just to prove that they had been depressurized. Um, some of the valves weren't in great shape, so once they're actually shut, they weren't going to open up again because they were just in, in bad shape. So. Yeah, basic sections were divided due to the existing valves. And we were able to back feed via the north south as well. So when you cut off a section, we were able to feed from the south and the north, which was mean one section in between could be shut down without any impact to surrounding areas. And may I add that um, some some testing was carried out in advance as well. Um, and there was two two facets for that. One of them was um, comparative work, but also from historic imports. That line had been isolated for repairs that were carried on. So there was some confidence in terms of uh, valves holding to carry out those repairs. Um, there was contingency planning as well in terms of fittings, uh, surface fittings, should in the event that uh, a valve was non operable, move on. Uh, but critical from my colleague was that um, there was testing carried out on the, uh, the section that, to ensure it was isolated before works were carried out. Kieran O'Keefe, Jacobs Engineering. Just a question in relation to was the annulus grouted afterwards? Yes, it was. It was grouted with, with, a, with a low string grout around the assembly. Yeah. Yeah, I just have uh, maybe a quick question. Uh, John O'Sullivan from UCD, and it's just in relation to the reduction in the diameter of the new main, and whether any capacity was lost, or was that compensated for by perhaps lower uh, friction in the plastic pipeline as opposed to the concrete pipeline? Yeah, in, inevitably you had a degree of hydraulic capacity loss um, from what was used because you've gone from the 750 uh, turn diameter with a 710 uh, poly- uh, polyethylene pipe. Um, talked earlier about um, the uh, trial and modeling that was carried out, but in tandem with that, there have been some upgrades carried out elsewhere. So there's, there was balance in terms of uh, using some of the inter- existing connections uh, to help to counteract, but also with the polyethylene pipe that was used. Um, it's smooth surface, very smooth surface to, to a polyethylene pipe. Um, so to answer your question, yes, there was a, a marginal reduction in terms of uh, hydraulic capacity, but there was other measures carried out in the, the broader network. 
to supply other areas and offset it. So really we're looking to maximize uh, the existing asset that was there and utilize that um, in the overall balance of what we're looking at. Okay, and just a follow-on question was the growth of the area, the population growth of the area, which I think is probably one of the fastest growing parts of, of, of Dublin, was that considered in the design process? Um, again, it's back, I suppose, partially answered by the first question that there have been other upgrades in the network to help to grow uh, to with the growth and those areas have been essentially the 30 inch main goes back 40 years and the supply area uh, has evolved. Um, so there's been some upgrades elsewhere in networks to take sections of the network away from what was originally supplied 40 years ago. So there's a global look made at it in terms of supplying different areas. But what we were doing here is maximizing the capacity of what was there, taking all the constraints on board and looking at factors that are, that are done at start of the, the project. Okay. Sorry, can I just come in here? Uh, Donald Minnick from TII. Uh, I'm just very interested in the whole area of life cycle renewal, and you've you've just talked there about how you've optimised the use of the existing asset. Um, so, what's the next step? So, if in, are we in 40 years' time going to be talking about how the blue pipe was taken back out again and replaced with a different blue pipe, or what's the anticipated design life of this uh, slip-lined uh, water main that we have now? Uh, typically, polyethylene pipes. Um, the design length typically is around 40 to 50 years on one end. Um, the, I suppose we'll come back to this project come in uh, here in the zone, as I said, uh, 40 years ago, 40 years of aging operation started to deteriorate um, and majorly within the last 10 years. So it was somewhere in the order of 30 years from the original asset. So the target here is to get somewhere in the same order. Um, the good thing about this is when you look at it in 30, 40 years time, the original solution dates back 40, 30, 40 years prior to that. So that's one way of looking at it, I suppose. Okay, have we any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, I'm the chair, yeah. Sorry, again, Kieran O'Keefe for Jacobs. I was involved with this project when I was with Tobin's early days. The problem with the Macri pipe, the pre stress concrete Macri pipe, was not the pipe itself, but the joints. The um, rubber ring was hardening up, so the deflection of the pipe under normal traffic loads was opening up the pipe. You get minor leaks, and then suddenly it would pop and get an inch of burst. So we're putting in this um, plastic pipe, polyethylene pipe. You don't have joints; it's fully welded pipe, um, surrounded by a strong pre-stressed concrete outer pipe. So you removed the possibility of the joints failing and therefore I would expect the life to be longer than 40 years to be honest. Um, to go back to your question as to how this was possible, prior, the only way this was possible to be rehabilitated was um, Fingal had previously laid a uh, ring main, an 800 millimeter diameter ring main to the west of Swords which connected back up to the 30 inch main at this and Hall. So if that hadn't been in, this wouldn't have been possible because you couldn't have backfed the main and kept the supply going. Okay. Well, and just a follow-on question then, if I may, without monopolizing the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does, does the new line or the new 5.2 kilometers of pipeline, does that place any additional stresses on other parts of the main as a consequence of you know, not being able to release pressures in those where pressures were once released, if that makes sense? Yeah, probably likely. Uh, like the, you'll probably increase the pressure now on the outer network, yes. and um, which could have knock-on effects. We've had a couple of leaks, and maybe it's it's linked to it, but uh, it's hard to just or John completely associate with it. But yeah, likely to be some like higher pressure experience okay. on the outer uh, network. I suppose from uh, water conservation projects generally, uh, it's always an issue in terms of. Uh, does the problem move on as it start to rehabilitate sections? And in part of the whole, I mentioned active leakage control, one of the other pillars of active leakage control is pressure management. So uh, pressure reducing valves are one. They're a follow on from that. Uh, modeling, hydraulic modeling is tied into that part of that process. So as you're rehabilitating to reduce the pressure in other sections, there's some pressure reducing valves put into the system to help 
to counteract that, that problem. But the terms of passage is approach in terms of like it as part of that British control. Okay, thank you. Hi, Alita Kavanagh, RPS. Um, just on the construction methodology used and the issues you encountered, um, did you have many um, occasions where you had to dig out um, sections of the pipe because it got caught or stuck in repairs, or did your CCTV cover all of that? Yeah. And secondly, sorry, yeah. um, did did it, you end up pipe bursting any sections of it? No, we didn't pipe burst anything. Um, I suppose we probably slip lined a bit more than what was originally planned. I think. Okay. Um, I suppose as far as slip lining goes, we could slip line just about past an eleven and a quarter degree bend. Um, it was tight, but you could get around it. Any more than that would have to come out. Um, the valves were also slightly smaller than the water main, so all the valves had to come out. The T's had to come out. Um, but in general, in general, we, we slip line most of it, yeah. It's just really the bins and the valves that, that, that stopped us from slip lining. Um, one, one other point on that, I suppose, um, in terms of the, as constructed as it transpired, looked fairly good and fairly reflective of what was there. Um, and secondly, come back to your point about pipe bursting, uh, because of the nature of the pipe that was there, a precast concrete pipe of that diameter, um, not really a feasible option. Uh, quite, it would requ require quite a large bursting force uh, to um, displace that pipe with a lot of material that's around there. So, um, probably not, um, that, that was one of the measure, uh, considerations given, which was not um, really a feasible option for that diameter pipe. Based on, and I'd take a caveat that as well by the um, amount of that that's been done as well in the industry here at the village. I just have one more question, if you don't mind. In the presentation, you mentioned 420 meters as the longest length that you slip lined. I think. Mm -hmm. What what is what would be the maximum on, on a straight run? I'm not sure. I've I've taught the same thing myself. I suppose that length we slip lined was through plain fields, and the reason we stopped was because we came to a bend. Um, but I'm honestly not sure. You could probably, I would guess, you could probably do another 100 meters okay. before the weight and the friction starts slowing you down. Okay, I, I think one of the factors there as well is the fact that it's pushing the pipe rather than um, when you're pulling a pipe and trenches techniques um, you have monitoring gauges in terms of pulling pressure and tensile force so that you don't overstretch the pipe and if it gets caught anywhere uh, the dive would prohibit you from doing that. Um, in terms of pushing and the, the annulus that was there and the type of material that was there um, I think you'd confirm that that made it more um, Conducive to the method that was used and pushing that, but uh, uh, I think the 420 as well came later in the project as probably the experience are you were developing. Yeah, more it, was, it, was, it was through the playing fields, so it would have been later on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Have we any final questions? Okay, so that's great, thank you. And just before we conclude, then I'm going to at the outset I mentioned that this was a co-hosted event between the Civil Division and the Water and Environmental Engineering Society. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Don O'Heaney uh, from the Water and Event Environmental Engineering Society to give a thanks to all of the speakers and indeed Cahill who uh, didn't speak this evening but contributed to the presentation. Okay, thanks all. Uh, just very quickly, uh, on behalf of the Water and Environmental Engineering Society, just thanks to John and the Civil Division for uh, kindly offering to co-host the event. Um, I I was just uh, just reflecting on it there on all the different parts and the collaborative approach there, and I thought it was a very interesting example of you know a very tricky engineering. Uh, contract um, done with you know a great innovative technology but there was also a lot of other aspects to it specifically I suppose it was the communications aspect and the, and the stakeholder uh, engagement aspect and also the contract management aspect so I think it was a it was a kind of a fascinating run through from from start to finish for us all so uh, so just on behalf of, of us all here just to say thanks to to Peter and Owen from Irish Water uh, and Patrick uh, from Tobin's and Colin from GMC. Thank you. Thank you.
So that concludes the uh, the presentation for this evening. But while you're all in the room, maybe I'll just draw your attention to our next lecture from the Civil Division. So we don't have a lecture in December, uh, but our next lecture is scheduled for the 20th of January. It's going to be a co-hosted event with the Roads and Transport Engineering Society. And the topic of the presentation is going to be on the Dublin-Galway cycleway. So thank you very much and thank you for attending.